Hi, we're just about to get started again, so settle in. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Apparently, updates are ready to install. Hi, I'm Rika. I'm a card payment switch on the new cards project in the card squad. I've been at Monzo for just over two years now. Uh, so what does card squad do? We are responsible for all of your hot coral and non-hot coral physical cards, all of your digital cards, including Apple Pay, Google Pay, and other payment systems. We're responsible for 3D Secure, MasterCard authorization processing, so approving or declining transactions. We're responsible for MasterCard clearing, which is getting the money to where it needs to be after you've made a payment. And we're also responsible for card ordering and several other things. We process, at our peak, over 50 card payments a second. This is generally around Friday lunchtime. And we're responsible for 82,500 card orders per week now. We own just over 150 microservices that's powering all of this. And we maintain quite a lot of internal documentation. We do this all with seven engineers and one scheme manager and some 11 wonderful people in operation. But short, we do card tricks. We hold all the cards. So how do we make one? It all starts with our superpower. Reading manuals. Tens of thousands of pages of manuals. I cannot stress how many there are. Every little thing about your card has been documented somewhere in a manual, probably by one of these three companies. So we've got the International Organization for Standardization, uh, EMVCO, and Muscard. Let's take ISO first. Ever wondered why? All credit, debit, and ID cards have the same shape, style, and general look and feel. Well, that's an ISO standard. Ever wondered why SIM cards are basically just cut down smart code? Again, ISO standard. That in particular is ISO 7810. We also have ISO 7816, which is 15 parts. It is a really thick one. It defines all of the physical characteristics of your card, including you know, how much voltage it takes and where the data pins are. And there's also, for contactless, at least on the physical level, ISO 14443. On the messaging side, the messages we get back from MasterCard are actually just ISO 8583 messages. They're not some XML or JSON, they're this weird binary format. Thankfully, this one is on Wikipedia. My favorite data element is 48, which is private use. That's where MasterCard store all the fun stuff. EMV code specifications power most digital payments online today. EMV is a cross-scheme set of standards for how card and many online payments work. It's used by MasterCard, Visa, American Express, China Union Pay, Discover, Diners Club International, and so many more. You can think of EMV code as powering or EMB standards as being chip and pin, contactless, the very basic technologies. And then we have MasterCard. Their standards include how a transaction actually takes place, what rules that transaction takes place under, and how money is actually moved as a result of that transaction. If you're interested, you can freely Google some MasterCard documents, including the MasterCard rules, the transaction processing rules, and a version of the UK domestic rules. But I assure you, there are hundreds more of these that I cannot show you. So you get it. We read a lot of manuals. How do we actually make a card? So first of all, we talk to a relevant squad. Or more accurately, a relevant squad comes and talks to us. In the last six months, I've been working closely with business banking on their launch and the Monzo Plus teams on their second generation of Plus cards. Let's focus today on business banking. So business banking comes and talks to us. 
we gather all the requirements, read some more manuals, come back with some questions. Generally, short term. And then we send them over to design, who have an, another stack of manuals. <laughs> and design get to work on how the card will look and feel, ending up with a card, well, a design that looks roughly like this. They send that then to our manufacturers and work closely with our manufacturers to work out how they're actually going to make it, what materials they're going to use. And they'll start making the blanks. Here are two blanks from my card sample library. You see they haven't got any text embossed on them yet. And while we're waiting for that, we've got some work to do configuring what we want the chip to do. How do you configure a chip? Read manuals. If that doesn't really clear anything up, there's more manuals. This is a simplification of the stack that we work with. We start with a chip that's sourced to us by our manufacturers. We generally get to pick from a few that have different capabilities, such as contactless or non-contactless. And we often talk about payments cards having the processing power of a Nintendo game board. How true is that? Well, I could not get anybody to let me tell you what the specific specifications of a Monzo card chips are. So I've gone for an average off-the-shelf smart card here. Here we can see the Game Boy clearly wins here with Tetris, and both are very cool to carry in 2019. <laughs> On top of the hardware, we have an EMB kernel and smart card OS. This is typically provided for us by the card manufacturer. Probably going to be some Java card variant or Multos and it'll be paired with the hardware provided to us, pre-certified. You can think of this in the same way as iOS comes on iPhones and Android comes on various Android phones, and you can't switch between those on the same hardware. Um, on top of the OS, we have the MasterCard application supplied by MasterCard. We always tend to use the latest version possible, which is currently at NCHIP Advanced 1.2, and that's all I'm allowed to tell you. <laughs> You can also have other applications on your card. Most UK debit cards will have at least two other applications, one for the Link ATM network and one for what's called chip authentication protocol, which powers those much disliked online banking pin entry security devices. And then we get to where our secret sauce is, Monzo's chip profile. A chip profile tells the payment card how to behave. Everything below this is pretty standard. You'll find it on every payment card but here's where we get to put our stuff. Some context of the chip profile card, there is a lot more here, but we define things like card capabilities, whether it's allowed to make offline payments and various other things. Um, supported verification methods, we tell it whether it's gonna support PIN or whether it will take contact or take contactless with no CVM, a cardholder verification method, and whether it'll allow signature. We tend to put signature right at the bottom. It also, weirdly, holds a simple currency conversion table for certain countries, um, for example, the US and all of uh, Europe, which is just generally used to calculate a few internal things. We have a few transaction counters. This um, is used for replay protection and also for fraud limitation. Once we have this profile, we send it off to an external testing company who make sure we haven't made any big mistakes, like allowing unlimited offline transactions. Um, once they give their go-ahead, we then send our profile to our manufacturer partners, who will then qualify it for the chip and get to work on making that. At the same time, we choose the bank identification number that we're going to launch this product onto, which is the first between six and eight digits of the card. This is also sometimes referred to as the issuer identification number. If you look at our cards today, all of them will start with 535522, which effectively just means Monzo Debit MasterCard. Um, you can think of these kind of like a phone number. Um, five is potentially the country of MasterCard, and 35522 being the region of Monzo. The rest of this is your own card number. So if you're going to post some of your card numbers, please post the first half, because it's the same for all cards. But we can't use this for business banking. Um, we did gain some permissions to issue some personal cards attached to business accounts for very early preview. Um, but for a full launch, EU law requires that proper business cards are marked as such. 
because the limit on how much we can, well, how much MasterCard can charge a store for transactions are different between personal and business cards, which is a very good thing. So we need a new first six digits of the card. How do you get one? Well, short answer, read some more manuals, uh, find the form, fill it out, and pay your MasterCard some money. And then you wait a bit, and then one day you'll get an email and you suddenly have one. But we can't use it yet. To do that, we need to perform a key ceremony, which is totally not an ancient ritual. There we go. What is a key? A uh, key is a very long, random set of texts, much longer than this. Uh, we need to generate them incredibly securely uh, in no way that no human ever sees the whole thing. Uh, but how do we ensure this? Let a computer do it. Uh, under supervision from multiple human eyes, of course, um, because they who control the machine uh, control the output, and we can't trust any one person, hence why we have to call a ceremony. My team starts by writing a script and a document describing what needs to be done. Uh, we do this in the same language we use to write our backend services, which is Go. And we schedule the time to run it when at least three designated security officers are available. On the day of a key ceremony, we lock our key security officers in a room together, and each of them inputs secret components after reviewing all of the code that we've written. They then run the script on the dedicated secure laptop, generating all of the keys that we've asked it to. It's like rolling dice potentially millions of times. The script will then automatically package the keys up securely using the key encryption keys, <laughs> which we've previously exchanged with card manufacturers and all other parties. And then from there, we are able to leave the room and begins the process of securely transmitting these keys to their destination. This includes some keys going to, our, to card manufacturers. We send a copy of some of them to MasterCard for services that they provide. But most of them, in fact, almost all of them go into our vault for MasterCard services that we run to use. But why go to all this effort just to generate some random numbers? Well, this has to be verifiably secure. All this ensures that when you make a transaction, we can authenticate the purchase as coming from a genuine Monzo card. And you're probably wondering, what exactly are these keys? Well, <laughs> there are a ton of them. They generate the CVC1, which is encoded in the magnetic stripe on the back of your card. Uh, the CVC2, the three numbers on the back of your card. CVC3, which is used for contactless mag stripe, which is going away soon, but is how contactless works in the US. The chip CVC and the application cryptogram, which are used for chip and pin and most other contacts transactions. There's also many others that allow us to remotely change your pin and unblock your card. And also you, we have some that um, are in 3D secure. Of course, there is thankfully a manual for this. Our last key ceremony was for five bins and subranges. Uh, we generated 82 different keys, which resulted in 254 files which made it the largest key ceremony in Monzo's history. Once that's done, we produce a series of test cards, uh, which we then ship off to the wonderful people at MasterCard Key Management Services to perform some validation. Then we wait a bit until we get back and all good. And this is where we can start moving on to real production card testing. This is my favorite bit. Here's a stack of hot coral test cards that I picked off my desk. Um, these are now in a vault somewhere. Uh, every so often, I'll post a photo of new test cards Nobody's seen before and get some uh, questions. Uh, but here we can begin lab testing. Here are some of the scenarios we can test in the lab. We've got in-store terminals, ATMs, transport gates, vending machines, toll booths, and fuel dispensers, just to name a few. And this is probably the cleanest my desk has ever looked on a testing day. But here we can see the new Pebble Bray business cards being tested. This is what my feed looks like, because we have to make real transactions on the MasterCard network using our computers. When I do this on the joint account, uh, sometimes I get messages from my partner saying, what are you doing? Sometimes it doesn't go to plan. Uh, some test cases will fail. Usually at this stage, it's because we messed up some configuration on our side and our backend services. Thankfully, that's an easy fix. We have some which were weirder fixes. I don't know how this happened. Well, we, I know how we fixed it. I don't know why that happened. Uh, our label printer, uh, didn't like 
my full name. Uh, somewhere around here, the final card stock arrived. So we tested our chip profile, we tested that the keys work. Now we have to test everything together on the final chip. This is the first time I got to see in person the Pebble Gray business cards. Um, before, the only people who had seen them were, were the business banking team and also the design teams. And we have to run a full series of tests, which stress things such as the contact chip, contactless, mag stripe, contactless mag stripe, internet purchases, ATMs, we test pin changes, anything that a card could potentially do in the wild. Are there manuals? Yeah. <laughs> we run about 14 different categories of tests covering every situation. And each test end to end can be about 60 transactions. And this has to be done for every single change we make to our card. We don't ever want to ship a broken card, both because we don't want to ship you broken cards and because broken cards are potentially dangerous under some circumstances. And this is really our last defense against that. As a fun fact, I always know which cards I put through to lab testing because they gain this these uh, four marks from the specific readers we use. Once they're lab testing, tested, we can take them into the real world. In the real world, we use our cards as our primary cards as a bit. This is the only time that we are allowed multiple cards active on our accounts uh, until the app gets fixed for that. Um, we go traveling around, we go shopping, we buy food at a range of common and known problematic merchants. Uh, which can get a little awkward in stores when you have a wallet that has more than 10 cards that are all identical, and you're excited when a transaction goes through. <laughs> they also don't like it when you uh, get curious when a transaction declines. I wonder why. After some time in the world uh, with multiple people carrying them as their daily cards, we eventually give our final sign-off. Uh, for the business banking cards, I gave my sign-off just this past Wednesday. Uh, that's two days after this blog post went live. And this is where the work really pays off, and it's something that I'm really proud of. Various physical card projects have been my life for, for the last nearly six months. Business banking cards in particular have been at least three months in the making uh, of my intensive work, and the intensive work of several other people across a range of our partners. Uh, it hasn't always been easy. <laughs> But I'm incredibly proud of what we've been able to achieve in taking Monzo from the hot coral 535522 debit cards to these pebble gray 535199, uh, the hot coral, the lagoon blue, the midnight sky, 535778, V2 Monzo Plus cards coming later this summer, and other announced, unannounced projects um, that are coming later this year and into the next. I hope you love these new cards as much as I've loved working on them. Thank you for listening. I will see you on the community.